told my family, I said, when this house sells, I'm putting all the money in Bitcoin. I had done, you know, quarter of a billion dollars in revenue. I thought I was set for life. If I implemented everything that I knew, I'd be a billionaire, but I'm not sitting next to you today, a billionaire. We went from doing, you know, half a million dollars a month on one store to doing 80 stores. We were doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. You've hit the nail right on the head out the gate, and I want to understand how you did that. If you kind of peel back the layers, like I wasn't the official CMO of On Dutch, but I led the whole marketing campaign. And that thing was weeks away from going under and shutting down doors. And then I came back and I just changed the whole thing. Then five minutes of texting my friends in a group chat called NFT Degenerates. I placed a <laughs> bid for two and a half million dollars on Twitter to buy Pudgy Penguins. I'm giving you some game today, Frankie. Like, honestly, I'm a little regretting it in my soul here. But, no, you know you don't. Is the opportunity of building America so good that it's worth building in a highly taxed environment than it is living in Dubai and building? Retiring my mom was the most fulfilling thing I've ever done and still is the most fulfilling thing thing I've ever done. Money is freedom and the removal of the shackles of being obliged to anything and anyone. And we are back in Miami for, I think it's my third podcast so far. And guys, I'm hyped for this one today. I have the CEO of Pudgy Penguins, the NFT project, a man, Luca Nets, who's massively scaled in e-com, then popped over to the Web3 space, absolutely smashed it in both, and I'm pleased to have you here. Welcome to the podcast, mate. Hey, thanks for having me. Mate, thanks for being here. It's been a bit of a, it's been a, bit of a marathon, guys, before we got started on this podcast, but we've got it done and we're here now, and mate, I appreciate it. The, I, just, I suppose I want to first cover off, like, so that people have a bit of context into your journey, is kind of give them a bit of an insight into what you, how you first got into e-commerce and what you, what you achieved there first, because I think that's, that gives a real insight into your, your, your fundamentals. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, to give you the short version, I started working at a company called Ring Doorbell when I was 16. Uh, dropped out of high school right before that. And uh, when I was working there, I was there for about two years. And I was able to kind of integrate with a, a bunch of, you know, really talented early employees at Ring. That kind of led me into, you know, wanting to be an entrepreneur and kind of getting hit with the Instagram algorithm. And then one day I got hit with a digital course uh, and somebody wanted, you know, hit me with a really good ad, a compelling ad that convinced me to buy it. So I purchased it for $249, which was a lot of money at the time. And uh, the course was really bad, but it told me and opened me up to the world of Shopify and Oberlo and this ability of being able to sell any product at any time uh, with basically like no huge overhead. And that was really mind blowing to me. So within a couple months, I was looking for products that had low uh, return rates, you know, fast shipping, you know, rates, as well as like just high margin products, like high margin, low friction is kind of what I was optimizing for. And then I went into the jewelry niche. And so I saw the statistic on Instagram that basically said hip hop was the fastest growing genre in music. I thought to myself, well, how does a kid want to look like their favorite rapper? Uh, probably a gold chain or a diamond ring would probably do it. Now you can't, uh, not everyone can afford a $20,000 diamond chain or a $10,000 diamond ring, but there's really great replicas on the internet uh, using cubic zirconia and gold plated. And you can now look like your favorite rapper for a hundred bucks. Um, and the cost on that was super cheap. And so I just found product market fit in a really great niche really early on uh, before a lot of other people were doing it. And so I kind of pioneered um, that little industry uh, about maybe seven, eight years ago. Uh, within a couple of months, I went from doing, you know, First month, no success. Second month, you know, 10, 20 grand. Third month, 100 grand. You know, fourth, fifth month, you know, doing half a million dollars a month with, you know, 60, 70% margins. You know, 18 year old kid at the time, you know, drop shipping from AliExpress, like to the customer. Once I started, you know, making enough money, I inventoried it, you know, got a warehouse. And then what I ended up doing is I ended up. As the business later scaled, I was using influencers to market this, so this was not paid ads. I found that you know I was using um, you know fan pages and things like that to promote these products. So I'd hustle all day, uh, spend maybe fifty dollars on a fan page promotion. He'd make me eight hundred dollars back, and kind of just keep on doing the funnel. Then I realized that there was a bunch of influencers that I was using that were converting me a ton of dollars, and rather than just like continuing to pay them. I found an affinity for them. Like they, we started to become friends and started building relationships amongst the people that I was paying to promote my products. 
And then I realized I had watched like some sort of, I kept on buying courses at the time and somebody had told me something about trust. I thought to myself, well, instead of naming this, you know, goldcartel.com, what if I named it like, you know, johnnymackerel.com or just like just went down, like built brands around the influencer themselves, uh, leveraging their name to create trust to their audience and then just having a revenue share between us and them. But I was selling the same products across the board. And so at one point I'd have, you know, 80 different Shopify stores running with 80 different influencers, all promoting the same product, but under like a different brand and a different name, usually associated to theirs. And what I found is that like doubled and tripled conversion. And so I thought that was super, super important. And so we went from doing, you know, half a million dollars a month on one store to doing 80 stores that were all doing, you know, one to 20 grand, 25, 30 grand a piece. And that ended up doing like when you combined it all, we were doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a day for, you know, 24 months, uh, kind of just rinsing and repeating this product cycle. So I would buy all of these same products, stock them in the States you know, I'd have different varieties, so I expanded outside of the jewelry niche. I got into, like, electronics and accessories and things like that. And then I would basically take, you know, depending on the influencer and their style, you know, if it was, you know, a young, hip influencer, then they would sell chains and, and jewelry. If it was, you know, a prank prankster influencer, they would sell, like, prank items and, like, accessories. If it was, like, a girl, they would sell, like, bikinis and, like, leggings. But... They all, I had all this product inventorized and I would basically just stand up stores amongst each person based on the inventory that I had and what I felt like they could sell. And so we basically just built like this behemoth that uh, was printing cash. Now, the problem with that business is I was building no enterprise value, no brand equity. So when I, when I went to go sell it, I had done, you know, a quarter of a million, a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue. And um, I thought I was set for life. I thought I was going to exit this thing. And then all the private equity guys or potential acquirers basically came to me and said, you're really a babysitter and a manufacturer and a middleman. You don't really have any enterprise value. And then that kind of shifted my mindset. And so to give the audience context, enterprise value is when the business grows and scales without you present. This business was very dependent on me being present because I was the one with the relationship. And if you've worked with influencers in the past, you know how hard it is. It's a relationship-based business. And why I think I was so successful is because I was so young and these influencers, I wasn't like coming into them like dad and like, you know, like, like the old guy coming into the group. It was very much like a peer oriented business where I was 21 or I was 18 or 19 or 20 or 21. And they were 18, 19, 20 and 21. And we'd go to parties together and we would integrate. And so there was a lot of trust built into that. But unfortunately, that was not an acquirable business. There was no enterprise value. And so this really hit me like a brick wall because I had friends who had done one tenth of the revenue that I had that were exiting for 40, 50, 60 million dollars. And that was kind of my wake up call. That, that was when I eventually decided to unwind that business. I sold a lot of that business to the influencers themselves. And then I went to go on my pursuit for enterprise value. And so that led me to a couple different directions. Ultimately, the most fruitful direction of them all was a company called Gel Blaster, which ended up being North America's fastest growing toy company. Uh, and then that ultimately le- has led me to Pudgy Penguins. Mate, that is a phenomenal story. But I just want to kind of put into context for the audience when you're when you're selling off these influencer brands, were you were you charging these hundreds of thousands of dollars per store for these to these influencers, or were you charging? I was, doing, I was doing it for free, so I'd stand it up for free. I'd basically come to them and I'd say, "Hey, I'm going to build you a store." I wanted to go 50-50. I'm going to handle everything. All I need you to do is promote it to your audience. And I had some insane screenshots of million-dollar days, half a million-dollar days, and I was like, this is what other people are doing. You know, if you want to be a part of it, the problem is influencers don't make any money. That's the thing that people don't understand. There's like the 0.1% make all the money, and then everybody else is really, you know, making between one to $10,000 a month, which is, you know, fair money. It's obviously not minimum wage you know, flipping burgers at McDonald's, but it's definitely not life-changing money. It's sustainable yeah, revenue. Yeah. And so you come in there with a real value proposition, right? They jump on it every time, or at least at the time, right? This was like early. We're talking, this was 2017, 2018, 2019, you know, so really early on to this. So when you when you when you sold off these stores to the influencers, probably charging anywhere between like a couple of hundred grand to a million a pop, depending on what the enterprise value of 
what you considered it to be. I, I, I gave it to them for pennies on the dollar. So I think the most I sold one to was half a million dollars to the guy, but I honestly just wanted out. But but what, but why did you want out when you, even though you could have, couldn't you have pursued enterprise value and building something else over here while still coining all, all this cash over here as well? Yeah, it's a really interesting debacle. And that's kind of what we did. So I ended up doing that for about like 18 months. And then I realized that I was spreading myself too thin and this idea of passive income and being able to stand it up to the right of me and it being to be able to work autonomously was a fool's dream. Like the whole narrative of passive income, or maybe I wasn't, maybe it wasn't a fool's dream, but I honestly didn't, mind you, high school dropout to multimillionaire and like a year and a half teenager, no business acumen, no mentor, no father in the picture, you know, mom was pretty much homeless growing up, you know, living in the living room when she did get a home. So I didn't have the wherewithal to build the system and processes or have the team in place to really optimize that business. Like my Rolodex of people that I was with, I didn't have the, now looking back at it, it's an interesting question because I think the immediate excuse at the time was I can't manage this. So Let me do what I know to do best, which is just laser focus on something. So let me get rid of it. Though I did put somebody in place and I gave him basically half of what I was getting to kind of run and optimize the business. But when things started falling apart, people were pointing the finger at me. And so it was my reputation on the line for this bad experience. And so it was either I was going to be 100% in or 100% out. And the whole 50, one foot in, one foot out, I tried. And then when things started blowing up, I was the recipient of the bullshit. And mind you, there's a variable with working with influencers and in that they have the influence and they have the audience. So if, some, if, bad, if bad business is conducted, the last thing you want is somebody posting a story, pointing a finger at you saying, dude, this dude did bad business. When in reality, I'm, you know, I stood up the business. They did, got into an agreement because of my relationship with them and my reputation. And now in the background, I'm spinning this off and giving 50% of the, you know, of, of my percentage and all of the workload to somebody else who doesn't have as much on the line. And so it kind of came to the, now in reality, in a perfect world, maybe in the world that I live in now, I would have built the team and system and process to like really make sure that that business was floating the way that it was. But I had made so much money so quickly, so easily that I actually was, I didn't, I wasn't rewarded for good systems and processes or good leadership or good organizational structure, right? Because I basically found product market fit immediately through a very amateur way of building a business. And so I, at the time, as a teenager, was rewarded for, you know, not necessarily the right way to do it. And so I didn't know really the right way to do it. I've actually, we'll get into this in a sec, but it wasn't until real, really, me being a part of Pudgy Penguins and leading the charge at Pudgy Penguins, that I really learn what it m- meant to be an entrepreneur. You know, I don't think. How much of that drive do you think of being an entrepreneur was driven by the fact of you know you seeing your mum in you know having to stay in the sofa in the lounge? How much of the, how much of this drive came from seeing that and wanting to better her position? Yeah. So when I tell people that I lived homeless for ten years, growing up fourteen different places in basically ten years. They think that like we were pushing carts on the street and that wasn't always the case. And so what I mean by homeless is we didn't have a home and we were staying at friends' guest bedrooms. And when my mom eventually got a house, she was staying on the couch. And so to answer your question, there's an interesting variable in this equation that not a lot of people are familiar with. And living on friends' couches wasn't always that bad if the friend was rich. And there was definitely some rich friends that we lived in their homes. And this was interesting because this gave me the duality of life. And what I mean by that is there was definitely some homes that we lived in that were in the ghetto and that sucked and that were miserable. But there was also some homes in upstate New York or in Long Island and the Hamptons that were also amazing. And so when I was really young, I was able to understand the duality of life. I saw how miserable my mom was when we were poor. and I saw how great life was when we were staying at these rich people's homes. And so this was like this anchor that I grew up with. It's almost ingrained in me since I was like a little child that I just knew how much better being wealthy was versus being poor. And we were poor 80% of the time, but there was a year or two, you know, six months, you know, accumulated into a year or two spread out in different moments where we were staying in million dollar homes and guest bedrooms. And that was great. And life was great. My mom was happy. We were happy. 
And so I basically held on to that until I was a teenager. And I just knew that that's the life that I wanted to live. I can't imagine a young Luca that's staying in a home in the Hamptons with, with people that have created vast amounts of wealth in their own life, not asking these people questions around entrepreneurship and questions about how you could, uh, you know, go and create the same for yourself. So what kind of questions and who, what, what kind of people were kind of mentoring you at that point in these homes that were kind of helping you get out of this mindset of like, you don't have to be poor anymore? It was, I was too young to really be able to digest. I felt, I thought our way of living was normal until I was about a teenager. Then I started seeing how normal people really lived. Never wasn't in one place enough to really understand how normal people lived. And so I, I didn't, I, and when it was happening, there was no questions because I was naive and I was young and I was just, you know, eating my bowl of cereal and watching my Ninja Turtles, right? And so there wasn't much that I extrapolated then. However, what I would do is occasionally during the summer, I'd go back. I'd build some relationships with some of these people. And so I would go back and stay with them. And as I got older and as I would, as I would visit and go back, this is when I kind of extrapolated the information. Some of the things that they, for example, when I dropped out of school, one of the guys from my childhood that I asked about, should I drop out of school, probably gave me the advice that made me drop out and said, are you going to an Ivy League school? Do you think your grade's good enough to go to an Ivy League school? And I said, hopefully, but I definitely won't be able to afford an Ivy League school. And said, there's no point. He said, if you're not going to an Ivy League school, college is pointless. I said, why is that? And he said, because what's a college degree from a middle-level university? What needle is that going to move? If it's not Harvard, Stanford, or Berkeley, or a name that everybody knows, an enterprise name, then what's the point? And this is a guy who's extremely wealthy. And I was like, dude. This is a guy who went to Stanford and has been around the block for many, many years. And so that was kind of the decision, one of the decisions or one of the statements that somebody had told me that kind of convinced me to leave school. Because leaving school at 16 was a scary thing, especially for my mom. I had talked to her recently about this. I said, were you afraid when I dropped out of school? And she was like, hell yeah. Uh, so it was, it was a scary moment, but one that I knew needed to happen. And I just knew that I wasn't going to go into debt to get a business degree. I wanted to be a businessman. I've always wanted to be a businessman since I was young. But going into debt to get a business degree doesn't seem like something a good businessman would do. So that was my decision there. Also going to college and getting taught or university and getting taught by people that don't have a business how to have a business doesn't make any sense on any scale of the imagination, does it? So it's kind of like, you know, why, why would you even do that? And I, I still can't, I still, when I see... Um, all these people going to get business degrees. I just I can't comprehend on what planet they've 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 pulled this out. I really can't comprehend it. Yeah. So so your did your was your mum always encouraging of you exploring this entrepreneurial edge? Or was it, was it something she supported because she could see it in you? So I was an entrepreneur. You know, lemonade stand in sixth grade, selling chicken sandwiches in seventh and eighth grade, ninth grade, you know, selling some weed. 10th grade, selling sneakers and skateboards and Supreme sweaters. So it's kind of been there since a while. Um, you know, to be frank, my mom was a single mom with two young boys who loved to fight. I, w I was on my own, dude. There was no, yeah, she, yeah. Isn't, like she, her, her, her stress was, am I going to pay the bill this month? And how am I going to avoid a nervous breakdown? Like at the end of the, and then thankfully by the grace of God, me and my brother figured it out, but you know, I, 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 I think she'd be fine with me telling you that, you know, her instilling us to be entrepreneurial was not her focus. Her focus was about making sure that we survived, which every single month seemed like we weren't going to. Yeah. And and when you when you were going along this path, and obviously you're doing 18, 19 now, you're starting to print cash with your e-commerce businesses, you're going to that. I mean, I suppose that's when you took your took your mom away from this because obviously you put you must have put her in a, ho a house by then and yeah. kind of set her up and took and then obviously when she started to see you create this life for her like what what were her first thoughts was she just like in shock and awe that this had been created by her young son that she because she because her focus like you say was on completely just taking you away from poverty and then all of a sudden her son comes and says right here's a home here's the bills paid you've got nothing to worry about what, what was what was her experience from that yeah retiring my mom was the most fulfilling thing I've ever done and still is the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. She travels the world. She lives her best life. You know, she's making up for the 20 years of pain and suffering that I think she went through, you know, taking care of my brother and I. And 
I think as a young man, um, as a son, that's like one of the most fulfilling things that you can do. And I really hope that, you know, everybody watching this or everyone listening to this eventually can feel what that means. And that's the driving purpose. It's not the Rolex on the wrist or the car that you drive or how beautiful of a woman that you can be with because you have money. It's about taking care of your loved ones. Always will be. And it's the most fulfilling thing. And you'll find, you know, I'll buy myself things and then I'll do the same thing for my mom. And it is so much more fulfilling and so much more rewarding and makes me feel so much more full. Um, I know she's grateful. I know she's appreciative. She tells me a lot. Um, but I don't need her gratitude and I don't need her thankfulness. I just need to see her happy. And I think she's really happy right now. Yeah, mate. I think I think you should be proud of yourself for, for you know, going, stand, standing the test of time and doing the reps to be able to, to fulfill that dream for her and to fill that dream for yourself. Uh, I see so many young e-commerce entrepreneurs that haven't been as successful as you, but they're out there trying to, to flash it, you know, they might be doing 60, 70, 80, 100K a month and they're out there trying to buy the Lamborghinis, the Ferraris and all this kind of stuff. You were at a point there where you were making a hell of a lot more cash than that. What were you doing with all the money? You know, you, you can't have been, I don't, you don't seem like the type of guy that was flashing it about. I think, I think it's just interesting the way that young men are programmed today and I think it just takes a little bit of doing that to understand that it's not worth it. I definitely did it. Like, I'm not going to pretend that I didn't. Like You could go to my stories and you can definitely see there's that part of me. And I think that stems for me personally. I asked myself, you know, why do I buy certain things or why do I decide to show certain things off? I think it still stems from, you know, trauma from when I was younger and being insecure. I think I'm, I'm conscious of that. I think consciousness is a really important trait and characteristic. Uh, I was definitely insecure about my financial situation growing up. And I think a lot of the actions that I've taken since I was successful is to prove everybody wrong or to make up for all of those previous insecurities. I've since gotten over that. So I did a couple years of that. Where I spent my money, um, I think I diversified and I'm really keen on diversification. I spent about $4 million in venture investments that have all returned on paper. You know, that has returned really well for me. Uh, crypto stocks. I own a couple, you know, three million dollar plus properties, uh, a couple cars. So you know, it's a good good way to diversify. Watches, art. I probably actually spent more money on art and sports cards and NFTs that I like to admit. I just like cool things. I like to have things that other people don't. Um, but in reality, I think uh, we all go through down that rabbit hole. I think. When you are a young person, you're spending all that money, just being conscious. The, the one thing that you'll hear a lot from me, and you'll hear it on this interview, and you'll hear it later on in my other interviews, is just consciousness. But just being self-aware and not lying to yourself. Knowing that if you are the kid that's making 60, 70, 80, 100 grand a month, and you're saving up and spending a Lambo, knowing that you're a fool doing that. Like I walked into the Rolls Royce dealership going to get my Rolls Royce knowing that I was a fool getting it. But I wanted it because I wanted to... I, I really got it because I wanted the most expensive car. I didn't want somebody to have a nicer car next to me. I mean, obviously, there always will be, but you know, the Cullinan is probably his top baseline car that you can get without like waiting two years for like some Pista or something like that, right? Um, but I knew it was stupid, so just being conscious, just making sure that you're aware of what's going on and you're aware of your actions. If you know you're getting a Urus or you know you have half a million dollars in the bank. That's not a smart business decision. That is not a financially sound decision, but Hey, like money's you know meant to be spent. Some really interesting advice was somebody hit me up and said, do you want to move to Puerto Rico? Uh, the bull runs coming. And I said, I don't live in the swamp land to save money. That's not the point of money. You know, like the point of money is to enjoy it. And so part of it is to be enjoyed. And part of it is a lesson to be learned. I can give you all the advice in the world. You could probably give me all the advice in the world, but at the end of the day, there's a difference between being conscious of the advice that you know and also implementing it. If I implemented everything that I knew, I'd be a billionaire, but I'm not sitting next to you today a billionaire, right? And same with you, right? If you did everything that you knew, you'd be a billionaire too. So it's just about learning that lesson in life and going through the trials and tribulations, I think, uh, make all the difference. And so sometimes you have to learn. Sometimes you have to be that stupid kid spending 100 grand on a URS when you have 300 grand in your name. Do it. 
see how stupid you feel afterwards, and then you'll learn. Don't do it again. I think we've all done those things where we've 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 spent an allocated capital on things b- before our time. Whether it be the Rolex watch, whether you're at that level, whether it be the Lamborghini, whether it be the the four million dollar home by the water, you know, where you've allocated it all too early. I think I think it's, I think all of us have been through a stage in our lives where we've probably allocated that too early. But what's what was the kind of process for you to become conscious and to get and to get conscious? And how can the, the young e-commerce entrepreneurs, especially that listen to this, that look up to you because they've seen what you've done? implement some of your tactics to get more conscious and more self-aware within themselves yeah unfortunately consciousness to me was dealt through pain like what just pain? just the pain of making the mistake like that's the hard part right the hard part is you know for example you know not to carry cash with you but as up until somebody puts a gun to your face and takes the 30 grand in your pocket that you know not to carry it right there's you know, you know buying a Euros is not a fiscally responsible thing, but it's only until that money leaves your bank account and you're thinking to yourself, damn, I've got to work extra hard now or I don't feel as comfortable as I once was because of it. Now, they also can be superpowers. Like, it also can be a motivational tool. I think, I think just being aware, I think the best advice and the best thing that you can extrapolate from this conversation is just consciousness because so many people live in what I refer to as fantasy land. So many people think they're being productive or they're doing things or they're making the right decisions because of the lie that they tell themselves. Lying to yourself and believing your lie is a very real thing. I used to do it when I was younger. I used to hang out with my friends. We used to sit around in a room like this and we used to you know, smoke weed. And when we would tell ourselves and what we would post on social media is we just linked up and we made moves, right? We didn't make moves. We sat around and smoked a joint or a blunt and uh, we got high together and but I used to believe that. I used to believe that I was being productive. I used to believe that I, I was, you know, pushing myself forward. I used to think that, you know, I was financially savvy and making the right decisions. And until the writing on the wall and the mistakes were being made and the pain was felt, was I conscious that, you know, this is maybe not necessarily the right way. And so, again, it just sometimes you have to feel that pain to understand, you know, what mistakes you're making. And the key here is, this is probably the most important part, is human nature is a fascinating thing. And you're probably going to go down these rabbit holes where you make these mistakes regardless of you being conscious or not. So you can walk into a dealership being conscious is a stupid mistake, but it's not until you buy the car do you realize it was a mistake. The key caveat in all of this is mistakes are okay. And I've honestly spent and lost tens of millions of dollars making mistakes. The key caveat with making mistakes is making sure that you never make that mistake again because then it becomes worthless. Then it becomes me making the same mistake twice hurts, hurts me way more than making a mistake once, losing 10 times the amount of money making that mistake once than losing 10 times less money making the mistake twice. Making the mistake twice bothers me so much more than making the mistake the first time. And so I used to program myself, and I encourage the people listening to program themselves the same way. But every time you make a mistake or every time something goes wrong, tell yourself, what is the lesson learned? You know, like if I, if I you know, did business with a friend and he screwed me uh, and I lost a bunch of money, okay, that's fine. He screwed me. Well, what's the lesson that I learned? Okay, well, he had these red flags. He was very money hungry. He was always weird about paperwork and contracts. And so these are the red flags that I'm signaling in my brain. And I'm okay that he screwed me. I'm okay that he fucked me over. But the next time that I see these red flags, I am not going to let this person or another person do the same thing to me. So it's conscious, making sure that every time you make a mistake, you sit back and you observe and you think, what happened and what transpired here so that I can learn from it and avoid to make it in the future? Making mistakes in the forms of millions of dollars might be some of the best mistakes you ever make. It's about making not making the mistake, the same mistake twice. When you're obviously you're documenting that and, and noting that down in your mind, but are you is is there a, do you have a physical document that you're always updating on on kind of things that you've learned throughout your your journey where you're kind of putting them down so that you've always got it a working document to go back to? Yeah, I've got a note with all of them. It's funny you bring that. I'm very note oriented. Uh, I think notes are a superpower from to-do lists to lessons learned to um, business ideas, right? So I'm a huge uh, 
user of the notes. So you so you've literally got yeah. business ideas, red flag notes, everything yes. like a, like a CRM, all in your phone. Yeah. And then when you're going to go do, go do a deal, whether it be for a couple of million dollars buying an e-commerce brand or whether it be buying pudgy penguins, you run everything through the same metrics and through all your lessons. I don't run it through the same metrics like a system, like I probably should. But I deflect to them when I'm on a flight, right? And you know, Wi-Fi goes out. I'll go through them and I'll, and I'll kind of rinse and repeat them. Or if I'm on the toilet, and TMI. But you know, I just like just when it's there, it's present. It's and it's conscious, and I slowly embed it in, in my brain. No, I love that. I love that because you can always go back to that and and always know that that regrounds you in whatever moment you're in. So you, you're never unproductive then because you've always got always got something to revisit. Yeah. Obviously, look, you you pivot out of these brands, you you. You, you find you discover gel blasters. Now, that was a, a, a must have been another revolutionary moment from you. What do you think the key skill was from the influence of brands that allowed you to identify that first cab out the rank when you've pivoted from that into an enterprise brand and you've just done it in one move? Most people going from where you were, where you were the middleman, so to speak, to enterprise brand would have had to try a few times, but you've hit the nail right on the head out the gate. And I want to understand how you did that. The best thing that I learned from the influencer monetization business, which is how I coin it and how I refer to it, was understanding what is a winning product and what isn't. And so I didn't create or invent Gel Blaster. I was on a road trip uh, with a couple of friends and somebody... Uh, one of my friends, Jesse's assistant, Courtney at the time, brought out these guns and we started shooting each other with it. And within a second, I knew this was a Nerf killer. It was the first thing I thought. I said, somebody who bought Nerf when I was younger and was incredibly disappointed every time I bought a Nerf gun, I thought to myself, this is what Nerf always should have been. And so I made a story on my Instagram post about 15 minutes later and I said, who owns this company? I want to talk to this guy. And I basically came in and I said, I'm going to put this amount of money. I want to own this amount. And I think this brand has huge potential, but I think the marketing isn't good. And I think the branding isn't good. I think you've got a great product. And I think that's about all you guys have got, but I want to come in and do your branding. I want to come in and do your marketing. Uh, I want to take this thing from a good invention to a great brand. And so we wired them at the time was a boatload of money. What's a boatload? Um, $700,000. $700,000. A lot of money to basically take an invention and be like, hey, we're going to turn this thing. Oh, so you, so you literally just bought the invention and the brand. I didn't, I didn't buy the whole thing. No. So you wouldn't sell me the whole thing. But I bought, a, I bought a, a fair amount. And then we came in and did our thing. And so he had already proven a little bit of traction, right? The product was just so good. He's an, he's an inventor at his core. And so the product was so great. And then... We redid the brand, redid everything, and then within like three to four months after we did that, it became like the real deal. It was like a completely, you could see the, the, uh, the potential for this being a billion dollar business. And then the product kept getting better, and then the big boxes started to come in, and those guys change your business if they start making the right orders. And so Walmart, Target, Best Buy, Costco, Lowe's, I don't think there's a major big box retailer in the country that's not stocking a gel blaster. And now we're going international and, you know, within a couple of years, the business went from, you know, zero dollars in revenue to nine figures a year in revenue. And at this point, did you exit the company? Yeah. So what kind of happened during uh, the whole gel blaster tenure is once me being CMO, once it had gotten into big box, I had realized that there wasn't much like my scope of CMO, which was viral marketing and making this product go viral and gain traction. It went from that to, Hey, you know, NASCAR sponsorships and like, you know, rodeo, like when you're in, when you're in Walmart and places like that, you're, and they're such a huge part of your revenue stream. You have to curate your marketing strategy towards them. And so to me, that was not as exciting. And the business had went from a, you know, a really great invention to just a, an amazing play pattern toy business in major big box retailers. And for some reason, I just, something in my gut told me that there was something coming that needed me. I didn't know what it was. So that led to the opportunity of Pudgy Penguins. 
Uh, Pudgy Penguins was actually my first PFP NFT that I ever bought. The second I saw it, I'd messaged the only NFT I ever sent to all of my friends or all of my groups and networks that I was in. And I said, this was the one. It's a couple hundred bucks at the time. And they ended up being, you know, 10, 12 grand in the peak of the bull run. And I just believed in the character immediately when I saw it. Now, mind you, after a year of Gel Blaster, the opportunity, or that the last year of Gel Blaster, the opportunity came to buy Pudgy Penguins. And it was a random opportunity. Uh, I had no intention of it. And in reality, I had saw somebody place a bid for it on Twitter. I had texted my friends in a group chat and I said, should we buy this? They said yes. And without even really critically thinking about it, within five minutes of texting my friends in a group chat called NFT Degenerates, I placed (laughs) a bid for two and a half million dollars on Twitter to buy Pudgy Penguins. Totally not conscious of the decision that I was making. And, it, and then when I look back at it, Kristen was with me. I almost, I remember the moment we were leaving Sedona in Arizona. We were driving out and going to Vegas. And I remember like my brain almost being foggy and numb and my hands just doing the typing and the tweeting. I didn't even want to buy this thing, I don't think. I don't even think I realized what it meant to buy it. I didn't know what I was doing. And then it and then the post went viral. And then me just being the person that I was, I was like, I'm not gonna look like a fool and not the man of my word and like back out of this like a sucker, you know? And then <laughs> and then so I, I was basically stuck in this two and a half million dollar commitment. And then when I thought about it, I was like, I actually am the right person to do this. And at the time I had spent millions of dollars on NFTs. And I had believed in NFT so much. And I was so disappointed at what everybody else was doing. And the idea of digitally collecting and buying digital products is one that is only going to get bigger. Like, it's a no-brainer. There's like Arguing that total addressable market and the potential of NFTs, if you think that that is not going to grow and work and be incredibly huge over the next coming years, just because there was like a little bit of a bubble pop with the previous you know, trend you actually don't know what you're talking about because it's very clear that this thing is going to be very sticky for many years and many generations to come. And then once I had digested that I was kind of in this commitment to buy these penguins, I started to dream about it. And I started to envision what it would look like to build this business. And I thought to myself, holy shit, I actually think everything in my life has led me to these freaking pudgy penguins. From influence from ring doorbell being a tech startup because pudgy penguin is very much a tech business as it is anything else to influencer monetization because pudgy penguins are very much influencers and instead of working with other influencers i'm really creating my own right to gel blaster which is like the toy business and ip business which pudgy penguins is perfectly positioned to be a premier legacy ip and toy to Before that, we didn't talk about this, but I brought back Von Dutch in 2020. And so Pudgy Penguins was the hottest NFT project or one of the hottest NFT projects in 2021. Then it completely died. And so I'm bringing it back kind of the same way that I brought back Von Dutch. So you look at like all of these big moves and movements that I have done throughout my short career and all of those little levers and all of those lessons and all of those companies that I started or that I was a part of all play into what pudgy penguins needs from like a wherewithal and experience standpoint to kind of turn it into what it needs to be. And so then once I like, once I kind of digested it and I thought to myself and I think I'm a great leader and I think I'm a a great galvanizer. uh, And I think people, I'm a great communicator. uh, I believe, I think, uh, I think a lot of people would agree with that. And so just like, just looking at just my skill set, what I'm really good at, what my experience is really good at, what, my best friends at the time and today still are really good at Peter, chief creative and design. Don't know anybody better than him that I've ever met. Lorenzo, actual boy tech genius, now turned, you know, people and 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 people savant. And then now and then with like Vedant, who is just unbelievably social and like complete genius in his own right, uh, of just strat and just like just understanding all the pieces around me. I'm like oh my God, the universe just laid me up. The most obvious business of them all. 
the thing that I'm most passionate about right now, as well as the business and the industry that needs my skill set the most. Because crypto and Web3 and NFTs is abundant in tech knowledge, is abundant in creative knowledge, but it lacks abundance in leadership. It lacks abundance in business building. And it lacks abundance in brand building, which like I'm really good at those three things, you know. And so I'm coming into this market with huge upside, huge potential, but it's a space that's full of, you know, I think Apple is a really great comparison. Like Apple did not create the computer, right? And so a lot of these guys in this space are creating the technology and the hardware and the chips right? But nobody has packaged all of this great tech and all of this great, you know, potential into a package like a Macintosh. And so my goal with Pudgy Penguins is how do I take this amazing opportunity for innovation in a space that is IP collectibles and toys, and how do I package it in my version of the Macintosh, which in this situation would be a pudgy penguin, right? Because when you really think about what this space and the potential for this space is, you're really looking at a disruptor to a $426 billion collectible business. You're really looking at a disruptor to an IP business, the IP business, which is even bigger than that. You're really looking at a disruptor to the toy business, and it's all leveraged off of these digital JPEGs that are created and minted on the blockchain to, you know, prospective community members and participants that love or want to be a part of your brand, right? And so this vehicle that is the NFT, I think, is so much more than what people believe it to be on its face. I think people believe it to be, you know, maybe just a digital identity, maybe a cute little picture that you can, you know, flip for a profit, right? Right. But if you actually peel back the layers, it's so much more than that. It's accessibility, it's ownership, it's participation, it's alignment between brand and consumer in a way that was never possible. It's, hey, I'm making a toy line and throwing it in the biggest retailers in the world. And every time one of those toys sell, because you had the NFT that I turned it into a toy, you get a royalty in perpetuity. It's never been done before. Or when you buy a toy off the shelf of one of these retailers and you scan the QR code and you unlock the experience, that gives you NFTs that you can then use on your character or that you can then sell or that you can go and take into other platforms and other experiences. It abstracts this this monopoly that is, you know, Hasbro and Mattel and Disney and Activision, and it just abstracts that and just says, hey, this is almost a uh, free-for-all because you own this asset, because you own a part of this. Again, if this is thinking under the context that this this becomes the norm, but if this becomes the norm, there is going to be no gatekeeper or no monopoly to stopping people to create and to innovate. And when you look at like what the world and what human nature really is, we desire that. We want that. We don't want to be boxed in. We don't want borders. We don't want people to tell us what we can and cannot do. And NFTs just really at their fundamental core is digital ownership. And so the same way that you own your T-shirt, and I wouldn't tell you to tell your, you know, take your T-shirt off, or I wouldn't, you know, punish you for wearing that T-shirt. Right? Is the same way that I should have that same ability and that same freedom with my digital products, but today we do not. But if NFTs win and NFTs get adopted and that technology evolves and people continue to innovate and break those barriers, then your digital assets will be the same way that that T-shirt on your back is and it will be yours. Nobody will be able to tell you what to do with it. I I think NFTs have got even bigger legs than that, even on from the IP play. I, 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 I can see... Governments uh, uh, using it for transferring of, of 
titles of properties i can i can see say um i say i bought the rights to this hotel room and i had it as an nft and i and a fraction fractionized it into 52 weeks and i could rent out i could sell per week to a different family and that could be the future of timeshares and you've got all these different ailments that people haven't even considered or conceptualized on how this technology can be used because since nft can now be fractionalized there's there's no there's no stopping like big apartment buildings get bought in new york being bought by thousands and thousands of people in one move and you own in a piece of it i think it's i think the 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 wherewithal to do what you want with this is is, is unbelievable i mean even just reading about pudgy penguins and the fact that you you know only recently within the last year you've done 500k in toy sales didn't you like literally in, in how long was that yeah in 48 hours we sold half a million dollars in toys and it was more than i thought it would and yeah we've since done i think four million dollars in retail sales i think uh at the end of the year i'd want to push for 10 and if we can hit 10 million dollars in retail sales within our first seven months of having a toy line i think that'd be a great success um and so we're really just trying to prove the thesis right now right we've proven that we can sell digital collectibles you know pudgy penguins has had over 400 million dollars in digital collectible sales you know we've proven that we can grow social and that people love our character and they love our brand We've accomplished that with billions of views across all social networks. And uh, by the end of the year, I think we would have proven retail. And I think if we prove those three things, we will be a force to be reckoned with. What do you think the enterprise value of Pudgy Penguins has, has gone up since you acquired it for two and a half million? What would you estimate the value to be now? I think it's at, uh, you know, I, I can't really reveal too many details, but it's a nine figure business. Yeah. For sure. I think anybody would. Anything, anybody who would, I mean, I think, I don't think it's arguable at this point. You, you said, you said in, you mentioned in the lead up to buying Pudgy Penguins that you, you, you went into Von Dutch for, for a period of time. Is, was Von Dutch, a, Von Dutch a brand you bought out of receivership or? No, no, no. So Von Dutch is a quick little story, but uh, I had invested in a sneaker store on Melrose and right across the street from that sneaker store was a uh, store called Von Dutch. And so Chrome Hearts was a really big trend right around 2020. Uh, my friends and I kind of walked into there and said, you know, how much money are you guys making? You guys must be doing well. They weren't doing well at all. And I basically came in there. Uh, I actually signed a, signed a deal with a f- coincidence, but a friend had visited me. His name was Dan De Silva, and he actually came to me when he actually watched me sign that deal. But I basically worked out like a gross revenue deal with them. I said, hey, you guys are doing this much amount a month. Anything over X amount amount a month, I want a percentage of. And so it was like kind of atypical. I kind of say that I was a CMO because it's really what I was. But if you kind of peel back the layers, like I wasn't the official CMO of On Dutch, but I led the whole marketing campaign. And that thing was a week, weeks away from going under and shutting down doors. And then I came back and I just changed the whole thing. What what fundamental thing did you change within Von Dutch to make it uh, a viral brand again? Von Dutch was a disaster. Von Dutch, Von Dutch is just down to I mean, from from everything to the Instagram social presence to the website to making it make money. I mean, online that thing was making what a hundred bucks a day, four hundred bucks a day. When I came in, when I left, it was printing money out the wazoo. They couldn't make, they couldn't order the unit, they couldn't make the units fast enough. And that's Von Dutch has good manufacturing capabilities you know that is what they're good at um the business was doing millions of dollars when i left so what 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 was the what was the pivotal thing then you you came in there you saw you you tied it up the social in terms of putting it on the right influencers and you put it on and then you used influencer marketing to drive the revenue up by putting on the right people is that yeah, how so you it's a part of the playbook so i can't give you all the sauce because i'm this is a playbook that i've now I, I created it at von dutch i did it at gel blaster and now i'm doing it again with pudgy penguins and it's like working so it's a little bit too much of the alpha but it's it's very much a process that i follow it includes influencers and celebrities it includes paid marketing it includes branding and positioning and conversion metrics kind of like a full crow sweep with like huge top of the funnel awareness uh you know von dutch was i mean they they were they were making you know i mean Everything about that, I wish I had had videos of what it looked like before. I mean, it was a disaster before. No wonder nobody could buy or it was, it just looked like a joke. It looked like a dead, old, cheesy joke. 
And then you came in and the products were good. So the product was never a joke. But the brand, like branding is not just good product. Branding is what does it look like when I go on your Instagram? What does it look like when I go, you know, on your website? Like what is it, what does the checkout process look? Can I click a couple things and get to checkout? The other day, today I didn't buy something. I wanted this thing for 200 bucks so bad. And then the second it didn't have shop pay or Apple pay, I stopped buying it. You know, like just the, the, the obvious flows and funnel mechanics just wasn't cool. It wasn't, I think that's probably the best way to define it. Bondage was not cool before I came into it. We came into it, we made that thing freaking cool, you know? And all you got to do is make things cool. Gel Blaster, exact same thing. Gel Blaster was not cool when we came into it. And honestly, you could probably argue Pudgy Penguins. Pudgy Penguins had a cool community, but Pudgy Penguins itself was not cool. Like, it was not, it was, and even, even Pudgy Penguins, like, cool might not be the right word, but it wasn't even, like, kawaii. It wasn't hip. It wasn't forward thinking. There was nothing... You know, other than like a really crazy cool and and dope community, like the people inside of it were cool. The people a part of it were cool, but there was nothing to be proud about with Pudgy Penguins before outside of, hey, you know, a couple of rich people own them and like I have access to these rich people now because I own a Pudgy Penguin. Now it is so much more than that. If you own a Pudgy Penguin, this thing is the anchor and the leader for the Web3 space. I mean, we, we are breaking that barrier in a way that nobody else is and I think it's a brand that's uh, really easy to be proud about uh, being a part of. One of the th- one of the key things I want to pull out of what you just said there that I think will help a lot of this audience is the fact of that you what you've done essentially is you've gone you've gone through every brand, you've picked up the red flags and the green flags in all, everything that you've done, and you formulated your words a playbook. And this is a playbook that you carry and you implement and you use in every brand the same way. And I didn't understand that until you said it. But when you said it, it was like, okay, t- domino fell over in my head. That is your biggest domino right there. Yeah. The fact is that you, you, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, you could come into XYZ e-commerce brand and you just roll out the same playbook as yep. what you've rolled out in Pudgy Penguins, right? Exactly. And you're always innovating and stacking skills within that playbook, but the playbook never changes. No, um, it gets better. Now you right, can always okay. add additional things on it, like certain levers that you pull, but the baseline of the playbook is the same. Step one through 10 is basically the same. Just now I'm adding like steps 10.5. Like for example, one thing that would, that I learned about Pudgy Penguins that's now in our playbook that I never knew before. And this is some free, free games. So I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you your audience, what you want here. It's Giphy. So I, this was never a part of my playbook before. But just to give you con- some context, Pudgy Penguins gets about 50 million views a day on Giphy. It's insanity. And so why does that matter? Because you would be surprised how many colleagues of mine, how many friends, how many of her friends, how many of, you know, now that, you're, now that I've told you this, you're going to start noticing it. It's like one of those like uh, cere- cerebral like things that I'm... You, you've just increased everyone's awareness yes. as to something that's fucking obvious. Yes. And, and so I'm getting 50 million views a day. Now, where does Giphy get implemented? It gets implemented in Instagram comments, Twitter comments, text messages. And so what you're finding, right, is I'm getting, I, I can't even give you this alpha, but if you knew how much money it was costing me to get these views, it is the cheapest CPM of all time. I'm paying fractions of a penny for a thousand impressions, fractions of a penny, right? And this is like, this is like unbelievable alpha. And so that is something that was never a part of my playbook before. But I was thinking, I was like, okay, I want to make people more familiar around this penguin. How do I index it? How do I get it familiar? 50 million views a day. You know, if I continue on that pace, I'm two years away from being the most prominent giphy text message social character of all time. <laughs> You're blowing my mind here. It's just, it's, just, it's just, it's such a simple thing, but... Anybody can do that with any brand, can't they? Totally. So every brand should be on Giphy. Totally. Every, every brand. It doesn't matter if you're an e-commerce brand, a character-based brand. What about even like bricks and mortar brands? It depends on your angle, right? Like it depends on, you know, it has to make sense. I think character brands, it makes the most sense though, when you think about it. What, like, what brands What brands does it align with in your mind and what brands doesn't it align with? Just give me some context. Yeah, I think it aligns with clothing brands. I think it aligns with toy brands. I think it aligns with character brands. I think it doesn't align with, I think uh, a niche brick and mortar would be tough. Yeah. Uh, I think a, like, a, like a cologne wouldn't work, right? Like a perfume wouldn't work. A... Uh, you know, pickleball, it would work. Uh, basketball brand, it would work. You know, football, anything sports oriented, it would totally work. 
it would totally work. It wouldn't work for like an enterprise SaaS. Like if I was yeah, a B two B enterprise yeah, yeah. SaaS, it'd be like pointless, you know. But I mean, if I was Match dot com, I mean, I'm giving you, I'm giving you some game today, Frankie. Like honestly, I'm a little regretting it in my soul here. But, no, you know you. But don't. If, if, if there was an agency, like think about it. If I was an agency, yeah. right, a marketing agency. Why don't I go to match.com and say, dude, I'm going to index the shit out of your thing on text messages and, and through Giphy and all of this. You get a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar a month retainer. I'd be shocked if you couldn't. If you had the right proposal and the right results and the, you know, the right pitch, right? And you came correct, I mean you could totally close. Because think about it. Anything relationship oriented, if you can index for match.com and all of those, you're you're a made man. Match that's match.com was you know, just like thinking like that. So they, like they, Tinder. They own Tinder. They own um, they own a load of the other dating yeah. sites. In fact, if you're a good dating site, you get bought by Match.com. Yeah. That's that, that, that is the holding brand that all, owns all the dating sites. Yeah. I think they've even, don't quote me on this, but I think they even bought Bumble, didn't they? Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, so it's like they've, 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 they've ended it. Obviously, look, I don't want you to divulge your whole playbook and yeah. you're not going to on this podcast. I understand that. But I really want to give this audience more value than they've ever got out of any other podcast that you've been on or ever, anything you've done. What is some other free games, some, some, some 1% things that you've got in your mind that you've used to, to generate vast amounts of capital that, that this audience can just take away today and use? Yeah, I think one thing that is underestimated, and I didn't realize this until I, we hired an executive coach, so we've spent probably a hundred grand now on executive coaching and it's been super helpful. You know, you're going to live and die. Your business only grows at the capacity of your team. And so I, there's some businesses, very few amount of businesses that are the outliers where they just print. Right. And, and it doesn't, you don't need the best team, you know, kind of like the business that I was doing the influencer monetization business. If you don't want to build enterprise value and you want to internet hustle, which by the way, I defined my influencer monetization business. That was a quarter billion dollar revenue business. I define that business as an internet hustle. I do not define that business as entrepreneurship. It, the level of difficulty between what I'm doing now and what I was doing there, though that was a cash cow of a business, I was literally sitting in Bay Harbor in a 10-bedroom house doing nothing, making that money. Absolutely nothing. Other than taking people out to the club and taking people out to dinner and bringing them to the house and showing them a good time, right? Like, I was not working hard. It, it was one of the great stories of internet hustle ever, I think. Because I actually was, like, 19 years old, sipping a pina colada with a joint in my right hand and a, and a drink in my left, watching these dudes do crazy videos at the house, like, breaking walls and, and shooting basketballs from, like, halfway across the room to, like, printing that type of money doing that. And so what I know now... To build enterprise value, like what does it mean to build enterprise value? Enterprise values, does the business grow and scale without you present? And what is dependent to achieve that? It starts and stops with your team. Enterprise value, when somebody acquires you, right? They are acquiring your team just as much as they are acquiring your data and your revenue and all of the above. And to be frank, if your team sucks, your likelihood of getting acquired falls dramatically. Like if you're in the agency business, especially the creative agency business, they are not buying your client book. They are not buying anything but your team and your resources because, you know, those are really powerful and hard to find. And so this is a little bit, it's not as like directory, it's not as saucy blatantly as like maybe the Giphy advice, but it's actually probably more important which is like really define your team and define your leadership style. And we found that once we actually started to learn what it means to be a manager and what it actually means to the science behind entrepreneurship, not just, you know, make money, product market fit, ROAS, ROI, TAM. I think that's what people think an entrepreneur is. And it actually, that's what it is on its surface, Right? But if you peel back the layers, what does it really mean to be an elite entrepreneur? It's how much of a good internal leader you are. It's about your company culture. It's about what type of leadership style you use to conduct with which people. You know, we have a crazy thing that in our C-level group, I have everybody taken an anagram test. So I know exactly how to deal with certain issues as they arise. An anagram basically tells you like what people, what type of personalities people are. So if I know somebody has a big ego in my org, 
I'm not going to go to them and try to crush their ego by telling them they're doing a bad job. I will make them tell me they're doing a bad job. So my approach to the conflict is completely different versus if somebody doesn't have a big ego, I'll just tell them straight up they're doing a bad job or adjust or basically pivot my frame as to how I'm going to solve the problem based on the personality type. Nobody's thinking like that, right? Like at least none of the people that I used to work with. Right. But that is what I think needs is necessary to take your business to the next level. And it's very much a people business enterprise value and taking that step. You can make $10 million a year, $20 million a year, maybe even $50 million a year, not having these flows, not understanding this. But with pudgy penguins, it's billions or bust like this business. There's many other businesses in this niche that have reached billion dollar status. And if we do what we're doing at the rate that we're doing it, at the frequency that we're doing it, and we keep over delivering and keep getting better every single time. When the time the bull market comes back and like NFTs become the trend again, I will be the most valuable company of them all. But that is only going to happen if I keep upping the bar month over month over month. And that is only going to happen if we have just an insanely locked and loaded team. That's the only way it's going to happen. And if everybody's stoked to be here and everybody's giving it 150%. If they don't do that, this will never become a multi-billion dollar business. But if it is, I have the chance to, okay, hey, you know, I am wealthy now. I have changed my life now. If I look, she tells me all the time when I'm upset, like, dude, can you believe where you were eight years ago? And I'm like, shit, if you told me I was here eight years ago, I would have told you you were crazy. So I'm always in that state, state, state of gratitude. But the type of enterprise value and enterprise wealth that I can create through Pudgy Penguins is unlike anything I've ever been a part of. Nothing even comes close. Gel Blaster, that's kind of why I decided to make the jump from this to Gel Blasters. Once I did digested what this opportunity was, you know, Board Ape is a four and a half billion dollar business in 12 months. Now, granted, it was the hike, height of the bull, but that time will come again. Bull and bears are cycles. They have cycles. We've been 18 months in a bear cycle. We're not going to be 18 months more in a bear cycle. We got 18 months until the thing starts going again. So I got 18 months to continue to fire on this cylinder and continue to up the bar. And if I continue on this path and I continue growing the business and continue doing everything that I say that I'm going to do, then I will be in a position to create generational wealth, not only for me, but for all of our partners and everybody that's a part of this business with us, which is important to me. And that, I think, requires another layer and of seriousness, which I think ultimately is taking me to like actually learning what it means to be an entrepreneur. It's this type of thinking. It's this type of are the people in my org happy? Rewarding the people that are doing well. Hey, you're an all-star. You're a self-starter. You're somebody who, you know, does things without being told. I need to give you a raise and I need to give you a raise quick. You know, like just making sure, like pulling certain levers. It's so much a people and psychology game. I'm actually bamboozled by how this business has, or at least how my opinion on business has metamorphosized into this like new narrative. But when the stakes are high, these are the layers that you need to look into. And so without the monologues, I know I just gave you one. What I will tell the audience that I think is so, so, so important is understand what it means to be an entrepreneur. Understand, you know, what type of leadership style works best for you. Understand your team's personality types and really optimize for building the best team possible because you're going to live and die by the people around you. And you can internet hustle your way. You can solo dolo your way, you know, to a million bucks. You can solo dolo your way to 10 million bucks. But what I do encourage everybody listening is dream bigger, want more. Whatever your goal is now, 10 exit, 20 exit. And it's going to make you get into a different mindset. And that different mindset and that curve and that shift that you're going to have on that adjustment is going to make all of the difference for you, your organization, your partners, and your potential for success. Mate, I love hearing how passionate and driven you are and clear you are on where you're going and what you're doing and how you get in there. One of the things I'd love to understand is how much of an influence it's had on you having a stable relationship at the back of it. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I, I kind of believe like you can't, the way that you're out there, the way that you're charging in this world, the way that you're going out and affecting things, uh, you know, with all this drive, does, does, does that also come from having someone stable behind you? Yeah, I think just, just, uh, just understanding what it is to be a young man and understanding that temptation that's around you. I mean, I live in Miami and understanding that, you know, behind every great man is a good woman. I think you just got to understand that. Yeah, uh, it's it's something I've seen 
that every top entrepreneur, everyone that I can see that is fully in love with what they do and also fully fulfilled with it on the back end always has a stable woman behind them. Like there's there's not there's not one of them that I've met that I feel ticks all those criteria that doesn't have the stable the stable relationship behind them. So I, was, I think it's so important that we that we touched on that. I mean, your your this I just found I find it so fascinating how it's literally the same playbook that's been implemented into so many different variables, so many businesses has just taken you off. So I mean, it's like it's it's it's, it's crazy to think that everyone that listens to this has the opportunity to create their own playbook, don't they? Yep. And it, it, it's just a case of like, start writing down your red flags, your green flags, what's working, what's not working. But if you were going to give one number, right, a number, you, you, you encouraged everyone on there to dream bigger, to 10x their goals, to 20x them, because you realised that you'd, you'd thought too small for yourself. But if you were going to give someone a number and say they're just, you know, they might be, in a job earning a couple of hundred grand a year, or they might be just started a business that's just done a couple of hundred grand a year, and their and their goal might be a million. What should their goal be then? Should it be ten million? Should it should it should they be shooting for a hundred million? What, what what's I, their goal? I would tell you to shoot for billions because that's what I'm shooting for. But I'll tell you the number you have to shoot for, and anything less you'd be foolish to shoot for. You have to shoot for a hundred. You have to shoot for it. You have to shoot for a hundred. Because, like, I've, I've done this, I've thought about this, and this might sound arrogant, but I've, like, really peeled the, like, what is, what is the number that you would have to get to live? Ult- and this sounds like, understand, I know how this might sound a little silly, because I grew up homeless, and I know the value of a dollar. Keep in mind, I used to work six days a week for two years, making $1,800 a month. So, like, mind you, I understand how this might sound a real, little ridiculous, but it's important that you have this mindset because it's so much, it's so much a mental game. It's like fascinating. I, I, I'm not going to go and David Goggins you on like the, the ment the mentality of this, but it's so much a mental game. And when I think about it, like to money to me is freedom. If you think money is anything else, and this is an important anchor when you're making financial decisions, money is freedom. Money is freedom and the removal of the shackles of being obliged to anything and anyone, right? And so when you make a decision, when you're going to go buy a new car, you'll understand this when it happens to all the people listening, but you don't want to go, you know, when you go buy a Urus and you spend 20% of your money on a Urus, you are uh, all of a sudden shackling yourself and you're actually misinterpreting the point of the money. The point of the money is to optimize for freedom. And I actually thought about it. I think true, true freedom in its final form, I think is the, do- the dollar amount has to be $100 million because, like, freedom to go anywhere that I want, you know, whenever I want, in the plane that I want to go, right? Freedom to go live wherever I want. Like, if you really just, like, peel back all the layers and, like, you think taxes and you think and you're hedging bets, right? Like, I'm a firm believer that, you know, when I hit my number that, I'm getting a ranch somewhere in some doomsday bunker because who knows what next virus are going to cook over there because, like, they're definitely cooking some bullshit. They're, it's crazy because I was totally an anti-conspiracy theorist, and the older I get, I'm like, the more I'm like, dude, this thing is, we're in a giant scam. Like, it, they, they are scamming us, dude, I swear. And I, I sound, I almost like, the two years, two, two, two year ago me would be like, dude, what is this clown talking about? But I promise you guys, like, the more you just see it around you, the more you're just like, holy shit, they are you, rigging this whole thing. You tweeted this the other day. Yeah. I was going to touch upon this. You tweeted, the more, I'll, I'll try and think of the exact words that you said, the more I understand this world is a scam, the more Bitcoin I buy. Yeah. That was your tweet, right? Yeah. And I, I used to laugh at the guys spending their entire money. You know, guys would be like, I sold my house and bought Bitcoin four years ago, you know? And I'm just like, it's the only thing that I can reference that isn't, now, granted, I don't know everything, right? But it's the only thing crypto gives the people a chance. Now, granted, the funds and the institutions will come and grift the people, right? But it's like one of the few things where the people actually have a chance. In the stock market, you don't really, like, all of these things, you don't really have a chance. You're just riding the, you, you can ride the waves and the sails of, like, the market and the cycle. But crypto is the only thing to me that I think you actually have a chance, you actually have a chance to not get screwed. I think everything else you will get screwed at some point in time. But I think with crypto, you actually have a chance not to get screwed. And the safest bet in that is Bitcoin, right? It's just the longest lasting. It's the most, 
is the one that's been proven to be the most immutable and the, and the safest you know bet of them all. And so, I think to myself, I'm I'm selling my house in L.A. right now, and I told I told my uh, I told my family, I said, when this house sells, I'm putting all the money in Bitcoin. I'm just I'm just gonna do it because I've just seen this too many times now, and I think there's a level of consciousness where the world is maturing. There's a reason why the matrix, that whole narrative, which I think is kind of corny, is sticking with people because people are becoming more conscious. The whole remove yourself from the matrix is really a, a better way to frame it is, you know, give yourself some consciousness because everybody else is a drone. A majority of people are just drones, just droning through life, unconscious, unconscious behavior, unconscious, you know, sex with just anybody that they see, unconscious doing of drugs, unconscious killing of people, unconscious behavior to their loved ones. It's a, it's a, it's a plague of unconsciousness. I mean, it is worse than the bubonic plague, I think. I think it's the, and, and this is why the matrix thing is sticking with people because the people who are seeing through the lies and the bullshit, you know, they're framing it as the matrix and they're like, well, I'm against the matrix. And I think though, I still think the whole matrix thing is corny. The, the point of what they're trying to accomplish that narrative is, hey, Fuck this unconscious lifestyle and this unconscious living because it's killing you. It's frying these people. And the more, the, the moment that really woke me up, it's interesting to kind of talk about it. And again, I, I apologize for the monologue or the tangent. I'm, I'm infamous for doing this. But the moment that, that did it for me was SBF when the guy who stole everybody's money in FTX and then the Wall Street Journal and everybody, you started to see people starting to frame his He's not going to get convicted. He's going to get bailed out. Like you started to see it. If this guy doesn't go to jail, I, I actually might make like, I actually might have to like accelerate my plans of like, you know, an off grid, you know, ranch in like Wyoming quicker than I thought. Cause it's like totally rigged. And then, and then you just go down the rabbit hole and you see the other things and there's more things than him. But that one hits so close to home. Cause I lost a fortune in FTX, right? I lost a boatload of money. So that one really hits close to home. And that one really made me kind of just wake the heck up. Like, dude, they're, they're rigging this. And then you're seeing the politicians and you're, you're seeing, honestly, it wasn't even him. It was Joe Biden, dude. It was Joe Biden, like asleep. Do you see what's going on? You see these videos? It is, it is the most fascinating thing I've ever seen in my life. And this is not a Democratic or a Republican thing. I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell you it's what side. It's not about the colors. No, it has nothing to do with that. I mean, it's just, it's just about... I mean, we're all conscious that the guy has lost his noggin, right? Like, it has nothing to do with Democrat or Republican. Like, but it has nothing to do with it. I think, it, aisle. I think anyone that actually believes that Joe Biden's in charge of the country is 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 an NPC in my mind. It has to be because because, because there's there's a lot more there's a lot more to that narrative that I won't go into on there. Yeah. But but there's a like let's just let's just get, like I'll, I'll give you example. I'll give you example. Yesterday. India announces that they've landed supposedly on the moon and everyone's going fucking crazy. It just so happens that's the same day as the BRICS nations are announcing their currencies being backed by gold again and, and, they're, and they're at a meeting. There's a, there's a, there's a lot that goes on in narratives to, to, that cover the other stuff. The submarine and then during you know, the verdict of Hunter Biden. And again, I'm not, this is not a Democratic Republican thing. I, I'm, I'm honestly, yeah. I'm so down the middle. It's actually pretty funny. I'm, I, I, I take things from both sides. Like I'm, Global warming is real and all these things. So, like, it is what it is. But I'm just I, – I don't think that anybody who's actually conscious and aware can sit and look at Joe Biden and be like, he's running the show. I don't even think he, he's able to get out of bed without any help. I don't even think he runs his own bath, let alone yeah. the show. Like, at the end of the day, he, he, one, of the, one, of the, one of the taglines of this podcast is to break patterns and flip perspectives. And I mm. encourage – and I try and bring on people like yourself, Luca, that have, that have smashed it in life and just have a different way of thinking to get people to break out the patterns of this normality of life that they're living in. They might be they might be listening to this while they're driving to the driving to this job that means jack shit to them, and they just cannot break out that narrative. And if something in this conversation stimulates them to question the narrative that they're currently living, that's what that's what this is designed to do. Mm. So it's like oh, everything that you've said there, I hundred percent agree with, and like to to see to see the the world go like this has been painful to me and I, and I know you share the same same things but something you mentioned back in the podcast is you said you wouldn't go and live in Puerto Rico because you don't want to live in a swamp to save taxes right which which I thought was yeah it's great 
But what's your, what's your thoughts on a lot of these entrepreneurs then that, that are living in Dubai? I mean, I'm a resident of Dubai myself, uh, rather than living in the UK. Are you, are you yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a resident of Dubai nice. because 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 uh, because why would I? Dubai live? is not Puerto Rico, though. No, no, no. But I'm just saying, like, what what's your, what's your thoughts of people like people like me that want to live? I'd ra- I'd rather be a resident of Dubai, a tax resident of Dubai, than I would be Australia or the UK. Like what's but 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 right. but, it, but is but, but just to give you context, what what I'm actually asking you is this: Is the opportunity in building in America with the with the with the absolute bam? Like this is this is this is the world's market essentially right now for for English speaking. Is the opportunity of building in America so good that it's worth building in in a highly taxed litigious environment than it is living in Dubai and building? It's a great question. And I'm a firm believer, this is just me as an American, that this is the best country in the world. And it's the best country in the world for, I think, a plethora of reasons. I think one of them is the opportunity and the access. And then you're in the culture business. I'm very much in the culture business, and I have been pretty much since day one. Uh, It's the hub for culture. I think this is where culture gets incubated, and then it just moves to the east. And obviously, things in the east move to the west. But I think a majority of people would understand that influence resides in America, and it moves to the rest of the world. And so for the business that I'm in, it's optimized the best. Now, Dubai is an interesting variable, and I've actually considered Dubai if I didn't have to rescind my American citizenship, which was the caveat. And so I would never do that. You can't pay me. You can take all my money away. I'm never rescinding my American citizenship. Why? Because I think, to me, logistically, geographically, I've never felt more safe than in certain parts like where i imagine i'm going to spend my life in like certain places like austin texas or jackson hole wyoming or you know the upper side of montana or east hampton long island or pacific palisades los angeles there's no there's there's nothing better than that like just like just like from my from like a like just for for what's core to my soul, and this is an opinion, right? I, I would love Dubai. I think Dubai is the exception. I think Puerto Rico is a swampland, right? And so yeah. for me, Puerto Rico makes no sense. Uh, you know, money is for freedom and to live your best life, and it, it's not to optimize for taxes. Dubai, I think, is the exception. I personally am not a huge fan of a lot of places in Europe, and so if I was a European, I'd be taking my ass right to Dubai because I think it's a great place to live. Talk about safe and talk about all of the opportunity and talk about networking. I mean, it is the hub for Europeans to migrate in America, Puerto Rico is not Dubai. What Dubai is to Europe. Yeah. yeah, You know, it's like, that is a totally different thing. If we had our Dubai, I'd be in Dubai right now. hundred percent, man. And that, and and I'm glad you came to that context because that, that, that's what I think too. I think, I think if, if, if you're an American and you've got an American passport, I think this is the best place in the world to just come and absolutely grind it. I think if, if, if you're anywhere else in the world, I think Dubai is the best, the best hub for you. But caveat to that, even though I, even though I will reside in Dubai for some some months a year and, and be a resident there, I will always come to the US and and be podcasting that because it's such a great opportunity. But Luca, mate, honestly, you've absolutely smashed it, mate, and given me so much of your time today. Even though, guys, I was I was late getting here. I'll tell you now, I, was, I had a nightmare getting up to this podcast. But I hope this podcast has absolutely sent it for you on all levels, Luca, mate. I just want to ask you one one question that I ask every guest before before they leave the show. And it's simply this, mate. If there's, if if you had to check out the world tomorrow, and you but you can only leave one piece of advice for this audience that's going to move them one percent forward in their life from today that they can implement today, and you can only leave one piece, what would it be? Don't give up. It sounds so corny. It sounds so generic. It sounds so basic. But the difference between the people that make it and the people that don't is the people that make it don't fold under the pressure. They persevere through it. They don't give up. I remember crying in the shower when my first store wasn't working. I said, well, what else am I going to do? I'm going to go back to my old life, working a job. And I said, screw that. I'm not giving up. And I've had a lot of people close to me try to pursue my similar journey. And the only reason why they're not where I am today is because they gave up. So don't give up. I love it, mate. And I really appreciate your time today. And, mate, you've honestly sent it for this audience. And, guys, do me a solid favor. Yeah? Subscribe on all the platforms. Share this podcast with your friends. Uh, I genuinely hope this conversation moves you forward in your life wherever you're at now. Much love.